morning reunion. My name is Bailey. My name is Jessica. And we're so excited that you've joined us this morning online. Reunion is a family of churches throughout the Boston area with the simple mission of helping people find their way back to God. Now we have a lot to tell you about this morning. So we have our handy dandy <laughs> cheat sheet in front of us. Uh, so Jessica, why don't you start us off? So we want to welcome you to Fifth Sunday Serve. In the past couple of years, Reunion has developed a rhythm that when a month has five Sundays, we take that fifth Sunday to actively serve our community through our partnerships or educate ourselves on the needs and issues of injustice that are going on in our community. A few years ago, uh, we took a survey of our community asking what are the issues that we believe are the most pressing around us? Um, and from that, five themes became prominent. Um, so the themes of affordable housing, food scarcity, race, education, and foster adoption. So this morning, we have a panel of people from different local organizations who will share with us how COVID-19 has magnified some of these specific themes and the new challenges our neighbors are currently facing. I know that you guys probably have friends and family members who need to hear this important discussion. So we'd love for you to invite those people to this online gathering. If you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, um, you can click the share button below to share with your neighbors, your family members, your coworkers, or your friends. Um, chances are you know someone who needs to hear this uh, and is looking for answers during this season. So please go ahead and invite them. There's a link in the chat that you can share as well. For those of you who are checking us out for the first time, let us be the first person to welcome you. Welcome. <laughs> this morning will be a little different than most of our gatherings. We'll have a time of worship with us, hashtag Basica, and then Matt will facilitate the panel discussion. Then we'll have a time of announcements where we'll be able to share some practical ways um, that we can help our community. And then we'll close with a benediction. Thanks again for joining us. You came and broke them down You broke them down There were chains around us By your grace we are no longer bound No longer bound You called me out of the grave You called me into the light You called my name and then my heart came alive Your love is greater Your love is stronger your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Feel the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life. Oh, back to life Hear the song awaken All creation singing We're alive Cause you're alive You called me out of the grave You called me into the light You called my name And then my heart came alive Your love is greater Your love is stronger Your love awakens Awakens, awakens me your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Sing what a love, oh what a love we found, death can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive cause you're alive, oh what a love we found, death can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive cause you're alive.
Hi, everyone. I'm Matt. I'm the executive pastor here at Reunion, and I'm honored to be one of the the one facilitating this discussion with some amazing people doing amazing things. At Reunion, we talk a lot about loving our city and our neighbors and what does that actually look like? And that's a big reason why we started this rhythm of this Sunday Serve. And so one of the ways we can love our community is by listening and understanding. And so before we start, I just wanna let people know who are watching that we'll be hitting a wide range of themes and topics that are really complex. And so the goal of this discussion is that we hope it just sparks us to move and to engage more and to learn more. And so I'm gonna start with Matt and Lauren from Pine Street Inn. And so if you could just share about who you are and your organization and um, how COVID-19 has affected your population, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for having us. So I'm Matt, my colleague Lauren's on the call as well. Um, we are two thirds of the staff that run the volunteer department um, at Pine Street Inn. Um, so we're located, our central location is in the South End. Um, and on a daily basis, we serve about 2,000 individuals um, through four main program ways. Um, we have our street outreach team. Uh, we have emergency shelters. We have a job training program. And then we have permanent supportive housing. Um, so our mission is to end homelessness. Um, and during this pandemic, I think it's become more clear to our leadership team and our staff um, that finding housing um, is really the way to help people, especially in a time like this. Um, so for the shelter, um, in our main shelter, uh, there's about 300 beds for men, and then with a capacity overflow for about an extra 100. Um, and then the women's inn has about 120 guest beds. Um, so at the beginning of this, um, we had to figure out how we could social distance for a population that didn't have the luxury to do so. Um, and so we've worked well with the city. Um, we worked well with Suffolk University that gave us um, their dorm. It's a 17-story dorm. Um, we're working with um, the other um, shelters throughout the city. Uh, Boston University has given us housing um, for our staff so that they can um, social distance from their families. Um, and so uh, we've had to increase our capacity for, for that. Um, we've added screens. Um, on the dinner line, we've spaced out dinner service um, so that there are less people um, in common areas. Um, and it stretched our staff then because we've had to move to different locations um, in order to provide the same kind of services. Um, we've increased, you know, all the sanitation. Um, so overall, um, it's cost, it, I think Lauren can correct me, but I think it's an extra $250,000 a week um, to run Pine Street in. Um, we have 40 other properties where we have tenants um, and they haven't had um, the kind of same issues that our shelters have had. Uh, we tested in early April um, about, and we've tested citywide um, 2,200 um, homeless people. Uh, and it's come back at a little over a 30% positive rate, um, but most have been asymptomatic. Uh, and then we separated uh, the people who moved over to um, Suffolk University were the ones who tested negative um, and it was a, allowed them to distance socially and have a room. Um, and then anyone who tested positive went over to different facilities, a convention center or if it was severe to the hospital. Um, so moving forward, uh, we're, we s still are trying to figure out what the plan is once Suffolk takes over their facility. We're, we don't want to go back um, and have the density that we had in the shelter. That's just not going to help um, the population that we serve moving forward. Um, so there are a lot of challenges ahead, but our leadership is really ingrained um, with the city. Um, we had our 50th anniversary last year, which speaks volumes to, to what we do as an organization. Um, and then Lauren can talk more about how we can get involved. We've had to put a pause on our volunteer activities uh, we have over 5,000 volunteers that come in annually um, in a lot of different capacities, um, and everyone's itching to get back, but uh, we're taking a very cautious, conservative approach um, to how we reintegrate that, but we're, we're working with different departments to figure out how we can have people get involved still. Yeah, um, so we've actually, uh, as a result of COVID, we had to suspend any, anyone that wasn't a Pine Street and employee from coming in. So that does affect our really robust volunteer program. Um, as Matt said, yeah, on, on average, we have about 5,000 annually. Um, so come March, what, this past March, when we had to kind of um, postpone the program, um, 
folks that have been, you know, dedicated and serving with us for, you know, 30, 40 years plus, you know, had to be told that they can't come in for their meal shift, um, their monthly meal shift. So it's, that was definitely a really big change of pace for us. Um, but in terms of just getting involved with us at the moment, there are still um, a ton of needs that we do have. Um, as Matt mentioned, you know, the high cost of just running the shelter at the capacity that we're running it at right now um, has certainly been um, pretty hefty. We do have a, um, a COVID fund that folks can donate to. And I'm happy to send along, you know, any information for that. Um, as Matt mentioned, we also have um, about, um, we have quite a few folks in our housing, in our 30 uh, or 40 housing locations, about 850 tenants. Um, and while they're, they are able to socially distance easier than folks that are staying at the shelter, um, that being said, if any of them do get sick, it would be really hard for them to go to the store, to like pick up items, you know, just have food for themselves. Um, so we actually have a really fantastic Amazon wish list um, for our tenants, which has everything from, you know, things like mac and cheese and complete easy meals to brain busters to like pairs of socks. Um, so that's something, you know, we are certainly really pushing still. Um, we actually have converted one of our house basements into kind of like a pantry, which has been really great and a huge hit. Um, we have like housing staff coming in and picking up like food items for tenants. So that's been really fantastic. Um, and then just, you know, we're looking for, we're still looking for PPE, just like everyone else is. Um, if anyone is, you know, able to make like cloth masks or has the connection to any other PPE, like hand sanitizer, um, surgical mask gloves, still very much a need for us. Um, we are pretty, we're collecting those um, constantly. So if folks wanted to get together and sew some masks and stuff like that, that would be fantastic. Um, the other thing that we've been kind of playing around with is we have um, we have really wonderful food groups that actually provide meals on a monthly basis to a lot of our tenants in housing. Um, and as they can't now go to the houses, they can't you know socialize with the tenants. It's been a bit of a, a change for them. But we are asking if folks are interested in like getting a meal delivered um, to one of our houses, something like a pizza or any sort of you know I don't know, Chinese takeout, something that can be delivered via Grubhub. Um, or from the restaurant directly, you know, maybe sending like well wishes or a card or something to the tenants as well um, with the meal. That would be really fantastic. So there's definitely, we're definitely still playing with some options. Um, and there's definitely some things that are burgeoning right now that we would love to have folks um, participate and um, be a part of. I'm going to shift gears. But when you talked about uh, meal delivery, actually, this kind of relates to uh, Danielle. And so I want to introduce her and maybe you can share about uh, your organization. Um, and how COVID-19 has affected your population. Absolutely, it's, it's really gonna be interesting to hear about the overlap in terms of what we all do. Um, so I'm with Community Cooks and we've had a great relationship with Reunion Church for the last few years. And speaking a little bit to what Lauren was saying, our entire model revolves around volunteers. So we have a core of a thousand volunteers under normal times um, who are, um, commit to making a home cooked meal once a month and we deliver about 5,000 meals each month to 41 different partner agencies. So we work with homeless shelters and addiction recovery programs, after school programs, we can backpack, it really, really runs the gamut. And we have this amazing engaged core of volunteers um, who, you know, we, we have some folks who've been doing this for more than 10 years. We have quite a few, you know, probably nearly 200 who've been doing it for more than five years. So it's a really regular way to lead volunteerism into your life. And then we feel like we want to be there for the partner programs as well as the diners who are eating our food, but to help the partner agencies stretch their budgets and have more time to focus on their core missions and a little bit less time worrying about food. So as you might imagine, as like COVID started to rear its head, it was really hard for us, but we made a decision in mid-March that we had to suspend all of our volunteer meals. There's also a lot of touch points that volunteers are making in terms of delivering to us and then someone else delivering. Um, and luckily, as we were trying to figure out how do we do anything in this time, um, we started to partner with a local business, um, a local bakery cafe called Forge that um, wanted to work with us to try to get meals that we could deliver to folks and they would be individually packaged because normally our whole model is all about almost like it's almost like a potluck right people are making giant trays of food it's congregate dining it's often being served at a support group or in some kind of communal setting that brings people together and suddenly we were faced with a dilemma of like 
people really wanted food prepared in commercial kitchens and food that could be individually packaged for maximum safety. So we made a mad dash and started trying to figure out what each of our programs was doing. Some closed their doors temporarily, um, some stopped accepting food of any kind, and then some were still giving out food outside or in some other capacity. So of our 41 partners, we've been serving about 11 of them since the beginning of the COVID crisis and providing around 350 to 400 meals a week. Um, by working with Forge. And then in the last maybe five or six weeks, we've also added another dimension, which is unusual for us, which is getting prepared meals delivered to individual households where someone in the house has had a positive COVID diagnosis. And so it's difficult for them to cook. So gro getting groceries, food that has to be prepared is actually not entirely helpful. So we've been working with um, with a healthcare provider as well as with the city of Somerville, getting referrals from nurses of folks like that, and working with the same uh, bakery forge and another catering company to try to get you know a week's worth of meals at a time. Um, you know, I think now that we're sort of reaching another flux point where there's this sort of tiptoeing towards whatever reopening may mean that we're um, taking a step back to try to think like, okay, uh, we may not be able to deploy our volunteers the way we normally would for a while, safely, safely for the volunteers, safely for the program. So how do we both make sure we understand what true gaps in need are and that we're coordinating with all these other amazing food serving efforts that, are, that have been mobilized over the course of the past two months? Do we continue to work with restaurants? If so, we have a model where normally we don't pay for food because our volunteers donate the food that they cook. So um, raising money to pay for, for food in this new sort of reality um, and just determining kind of who we are. I have to say like COVID has really touched at the core of who we are because we do work in this very personal way and mobilize so many different volunteers. Um, it's definitely time to get creative. Yeah, I can imagine. I know a lot of our reunion, the volunteers at reunion who um, uh, partner with you, uh, we're like itching to try to get back. But we know it's no. not safe to do so. What would you tell them in terms of other ways that our community can, yep. I know you're, you just explained, you're still trying to figure it out. Yeah. Uh, maybe are there some tangible ways or is it more just wait and see and just, you know. It's a great question. And it's so heartbreaking for us because we want nothing more than to mobilize people. But we also realize that we have so many volunteers that to mobilize any means sort of a lot of questions around safety. So for now, we're, like I said, we're trying to figure out if there are ways that we can use volunteers in a hands-on fashion, as opposed to just saying, like, we definitely need money. It's our 30th anniversary this year. We were supposed to be having a big gala next week that's not happening, which I know is true for a lot of organizations. So trying to make up some of that and also the fact that we have this new cost for food that we weren't paying for before. So that's definitely a need. We are also... We're in communication, and I bet this is true for maybe even all of you, with other community partners all the time about what they're doing and what their needs are. So sometimes, for example, we work with a school-based program that gives kids um, food to take home on the weekends and does community meals, and I know that they need volunteers, so I'd be happy to share some select volunteer opportunities that are with our partners um, where they're actually using people on site. Um, so, and one other area, and I, I have to, um, I could write something up for you, is that when we're reaching out to the families, the households that are being referred to us, sometimes there's a language barrier, and we have capacity for Spanish, and we have capacity for Portuguese, but we um, have come across, like, Arabic-speaking families, or Mandarin Chinese-speaking families, and so we could use some language capacity, potentially, for someone to help us with some outreach phone calls. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. You're uh, welcome. I'm going to kind of shift gears now to Kevin. And Kevin, if you could kind of share about who you are in your organization um, and how affected you and the people that you reach. Yes. Um, thank you for, uh, for having me on. I'm, 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 um, I'm elated to be part of a, um, a uh, panel as uh, knowledgeable and as committed to the community as, as this one. Uh, my name is Kevin Peterson. 
I'm the founder of an organization called New Democracy Coalition. We focus mainly around civic engagement in areas of civic literacy, uh, civic policy, and electoral justice. Um, and we've been doing this work uh, in Boston, but particularly within communities of color, more specifically within the uh, black community in Boston for, um, for over 10 years. Uh, so the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has struck um, uh, my community uh, in, uh, in, in a devastating and disproportionate way. 28% uh, of the population of Boston is uh, African-American or black, I should say. 42% uh, of the victims of COVID, either in terms of c contracting the uh, virus or dying in the wake of the virus, 42% have been black. Uh, so there's a vast disproportionality in terms of how uh, the community that I serve, that I work in, has been impacted. And I know so many people who work in the, the area of community development and, and civic engagement and uh, advocacy of all kinds who've lost um, friends and loved, one, loved ones to, um, uh, to, this vi to this virus. So there is a, a, a sense of, um, a despair that sort of hangs over the community that's palpable. Uh, my organization, again, which focuses around civic engagement, has uh, partnered with um, Episcopal City Mission to, um, to uh, convene conversations. So over the last month or so, we've had two town hall conversations uh, with um, over 22 different uh, leaders, within, black leaders within the community. Uh, not to address the immediate here and now, because there, there are a number of organizations and activists who are addressing the here and now in terms of providing meals, in terms of providing face masks, in terms of providing um, education opportunities for young people online. That's the here and now. Uh, we've decided to look at where, look at where the black community uh, is six months from now, or 12 months from now, or 18 months from now. Uh, how do we begin to look at uh, constructing or reconstruction, reconstructing a, a vision of the community so that uh, in the wake of all the devastation, uh, we find pathways towards uh, healing and rejuvenation and, um, and uh, building community again. So these leaders over the last uh, month or so have come together and uh, offered suggestions around, about how we might um, um, project a, a, a different vision for the community, for the black community in wake of the devastation. And there were just a couple of themes that, that uh, rose to the top. There were so many uh, things that came out, but one theme that rose to the top was that um, uh, to go back to where the African community was, or the African American community, or the black community was, before the uh, COVID-19 virus uh, hit the community is a, is a non-starter. There were so many uh, disparities uh, that range from income inequality to housing segregation to uh, the net worth uh, um, issues in terms of the white black um, uh, vectors in the city uh, were not, are, those things are undesirable. So if we could use this opportunity to look at uh, how we began to address those long-term systemic issues uh, that are impacting the community along the lines of race, and we should use this COVID-19 uh, virus uh, pandemic uh, as a as a um, as a silver lining in the dark uh, in the dark cloud. Uh, another thing that uh, arose from the leadership was that um, that there needs to be a a check of it, the Black community's internal institutions, its advocacy groups, its civil rights groups. Um, even as churches around how it can best serve the community moving forward. Uh, how does it become more intimately connected to the most vulnerable and the most needy uh, in the city? Uh, it was clear as those leaders spoke that there was a, that there is a disconnection that needs to be uh, breached um, by leading institutions uh, within the city. Thanks, Kevin. Um, obviously, in light of you know past recent past current events, including the murder of George Floyd, 
yeah. many Christians are asking the question, like, what should we be doing? What should the church be doing? I know that's a, like a really big question to ask, but um, maybe uh, you can offer some of your thoughts um, and encouragement of what you think Christians and churches should be doing um, in response to what has gone on um, in the past events. Yeah. Well, as, as, a, as a Christian, as a deeply committed Christian myself, I think the, the answer is as ancient as it is contemporary. We need to be looking at um, ways towards reconciliation. Uh, and that includes um, uh, personal reconciliation, uh, but corporate rep uh, reconciliation in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the amalga uh, amalgamation of uh, all of us, uh, but also racial con uh, reconciliation uh, within the city. One of the projects that I've been working on has been the Faneuil Hall Race and Reconciliation Project. Faneuil Hall is named after Peter Faneuil, who was a, a slave owner. The building is owned by the city of Boston. Uh, and um, uh, we feel that it is an opportunity, and in terms of changing the name of Faneuil Hall, is an, is an opportunity to have these deep and um, critical conversations about race, uh, racial division along a spectrum of um, of uh, uh, indices, uh, so as to um, uh, move towards uh, racial reconciliation in the city. So, if, um, if as a Christian, and I think it just in, in, just in terms of um, uh, practicality, in terms of uh, living within a community, a, 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 a civic community, we should be thinking about reconciliation because division just never never helps and never works in, in in the long run. Thanks so much for sharing that, Kevin. I really appreciate that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to move on to uh, Ruth. Ruth is with Emmanuel Gospel Center. And fun fact, Ruth knows, has known me since I was a little kid. Uh, I think she was also my youth counselor at the point in my life. So hopefully you won't be sharing any stories uh, today. But Ruth, can you share about yourself and your organization and how COVID-19 has impacted uh, your community? Sure, thank you. Don't worry, Matt. I'm sure you have stories about me too, so we'll we'll stay safe here. Um, yeah, so I am Ruth Wong. I am a program director at Emmanuel Gospel Center. Um, as an organization, we are uh, working with churches and Christian leaders to help them serve urban communities more effectively. Um, I am a program director for the Boston Education Collaborative, so I focus a lot on urban education, and that's what I'll share mostly about today. But um, my colleagues in the other programs actually partner and connect with many of you, uh, the speakers for t and the organizations represented today. So it's really great to be here with everybody. Um, for the Boston Education Collaborative, we have been playing sort of the intermediary role as a bridge, uh, as a connector, as a networker, um, that's really trying to connect the resources that churches and Christian uh, Christians across the city have, and then to come alongside the students and families. Uh, most of the students and families would be part of urban public schools, especially Boston Public Schools, um, but also some of the faith-based educational programs that exist in the city. Um, and so I kind of have a, a unique role of getting to see how um, families and students are doing um, fri primarily from the district level of Boston Public Schools seeing, you know, the broad view, but also at the school level because we had been working with churches to help build church school partnerships. Um, so some of the schools, you know, we have, you know, good and deep relationships with. Um, and so since the pandemic hit, as you can imagine, um, so many of the families have been affected um, you know, really around their basic needs. And so uh, I know Reunion was part of um, volunteer groups that went out and helped with food distribution at BPS schools. Um, so food insecurity continues to be an issue for these families. Um, one thing that emerged for me was around diapers. Um, I'll actually maybe uh, show some pictures right now. I forgot I was going to share my screen and um, talk through some of this. Um, but yeah, so what happened was that I ended up learning about um, the uh, diaper needs in Chelsea, and so ended up rallying some churches to help with that. Um, but I also ended up finding out that, you know, 
many families all over Greater Boston had needs for diapers. Um, and so we were working with a Latino church in Weymouth, um, Pastor Johanna Perez and her husband, they are part of a large um, Latino pastors network called Copani. And through their network, they were doing food deliveries um, to families you know, they have currently like over 600 families on their food delivery list. Um, I was able to add some Boston Public School families onto their list, uh, but they have drivers going all over. And as I realized I had diap we had families with diaper needs, um, she's become my partner to help deliver um, diapers as well as food. Um, and we built a relationship with one of the BPS parent liaisons who, um, her church is actually in East Boston and um, they basically have a lot of families, especially undocumented families, um, that come to them for food and resources. And so we were able to connect donations from different churches um, and funds that we've collected through donations um, to, you know, provide some of the diapers and then also connected um, the resource of food from Copani and uh, another organization called Alpha and be able to sort of bring the two together um, and so they shared some pictures of these families coming. And, you know, in talking to her, to Elsa, my, my parent liaison friend, um, you know, she shared that these families, yeah, they really do prefer come to the, to come to her church to pick up these um, resources rather than going to the school or to the food pantries. Um, and I, because of our connections with school level people, so the food also went to English high school. Um, there's a, a student success coordinator there and she asked she reached out to me and asked um, about food for you know 20 families um, also I think all or mostly undocumented and so she you know received the the, the um, bags and then she delivered the food to these families um, and the last picture I'll share is this is from you all from your union and so as a neighbor of St. Stephen's Episcopal Church down the street in the south end um, you guys adopted and took on 10 families that are part of their programs, uh, but these are all BPS families. And uh, last week, Pastor Matt and Pastor Chris went and delivered um, your donations of formula diapers and wipes to this um, to this program. And so, um, you know, I think for me right now, um, oops, a lot of the um, needs and the uh, support has been focused on that, but I'll just cover a couple things um, other than the basic essentials. Um, so online learning is a challenge and has been a challenge for families. Parents with young children have difficulties sort of um, navigating this, especially if English is not their first language. Um, but even students, you know, I think I've talked to a young person that I've worked with in the past and, um, you know, she she's pretty motivated and, you know, a, a good learner type, but then she was telling me that it's been hard for her to engage. It's, it's just not the same as being in person. Um, and then, you know, uh, I think with the undocumented families, they just have a lot of hurdles and a lot of um, challenges navigating the systems for resources. Um, so those are ongoing challenges. Um, and uh, I guess in terms of how to partner, I'll just share a couple of things. Um, I, I guess the common point about funds is just everywhere, uh, unfortunately. So if you all were interested, um, there are a lot of funds out there for either money to support undocumented families, money for grocery gift cards, um, or just gift cards in general, because some families, um, or actually what I've been hearing now is um, families are having trouble paying their bills, like utility, cell phone bills. Um, so gift cards can also help with that. Um, I still have a diaper fund, so diaper funds are around. Um, but if you wanted to donate items, we definitely can take, you know, the diapers, food kind of donations. Uh, but if you're interested in being more in a um, active, like relational way of serving the community, um, my partners, since they are delivering food to hundreds of families across Greater Boston, um, they are interested in having a few more drivers. So if you are free on a Friday or Saturday morning, um, they usually do their deliveries um, Friday morning or Saturday morning. And um, if you are a language specific speaker, um, there are needs for Spanish speaking volunteers that could help um, my partner uh, organization called Alpha. They've been reaching out to 
um, families around to get them involved in um, filling out the census, uh, but also they, um, because they're giving funds out to undocumented families that wouldn't, that can't qualify for the federal stimulus checks, um, they also could use volunteers to help with some of those conversations. Um, and then lastly, I am, you know, I am concerned about learning loss with the students and um, everyone is, I mean, Boston Public Schools is also very concerned and they're trying to figure things out. Um, but I think we are moving closer to being able to take volunteers and mentors and guest speakers um, to help teachers and to help students. Um, and so if you were interested even in um, potentially becoming a mentor or tutor, um, it's in the works. Uh, so I could probably, you know, help with that too. Thanks so much, Ruth. I really appreciate it. I appreciate also that you called me Pastor Matt, which we might have to edit that out. Um, but <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to move on to Mike. And Mike, you have a long history with Reunion, still part of our community. Uh, but now you are with Fostering Hope. I'd love for you to share about what you're up to and, and how COVID-19 has impacted uh, the community that you partner and serve with. Sure. Thanks, Matt, and thanks to everyone. Uh, just really excited about the incredible work that's being done by the folks represented on the call. Um, glad to be part of it. Uh, I work for a small organization called Fostering Hope New England. I'm the director of programs there. I'm also a foster and adoptive dad. Uh, and at Fostering Hope, we help churches and individuals uh, care for children and families impacted by foster care. So there's lots more that I could say about the, the work that we're doing, but um, the foster care community has been pretty deeply impacted by the COVID season, just like everyone uh, represented on this call. Um, one thing about the foster care community is that there are so many groups that are touched by uh, the foster care system. Um, and so I'll, I'll just talk about a few. Uh, the first being uh, families of origin or birth families. And these are families who are still together, but DCF and other agencies are working to help stabilize and provide support for them. And unfortunately, uh, these families are often some of the first families who are susceptible when the economy is uh, rough. And so many of these families are experiencing a job loss or reduction in hours, uh, or these families might be essential workers or at risk for contracting the virus. And so in a population that's already experiencing difficulty with issues like uh, lower uh, hourly wages and food scarcity and housing costs, this season has only increased the needs and anxieties and in some cases crises. Uh, as these families work to understand and seek support through social resources and agencies. Uh, we're also working with a lot of undocumented families that have, it's been mentioned. Uh, their status doesn't qualify them for some resources or they're having difficulties accessing and navigating systems that uh, are hard enough for folks who are uh, originally, uh, you know, part of this culture and whose these systems are kind of built for to understand and navigate. And then foster families uh, in this time are dealing with a lot of the challenges that uh, many other families are dealing with in balancing uh, schooling and working from home, uh, maybe loss of childcare. Um, not all, but certainly many children from hard places because of their trauma histories don't deal with uh, changes in structure and routine or loss of critical relationships well. It can be triggering for them. And so many of these families are dealing with kind of challenging behaviors and emotions as they help their kiddos uh, through all this uncertainty of the season. Uh, a lot of the families have lost therapeutic supports, uh, especially early on in the season. Um, visits with birth families that were scheduled in person weekly are now expected to kind of happen online. So we have friends who are uh, trying to get their three-year-old to sit in a 30-minute Zoom call. And no matter how excited a three-year-old is to talk with someone on the other end, getting them to, to stay focused for 30 minutes can be, can be difficult or challenging. Uh, court cases, as I mentioned, have been held up, and so families awaiting adoption have had their dates postponed. Um, and then families have been asked to consider taking in children who've been exposed to COVID um, and, or even quarantining with children who've uh, tested positive. Uh, one of the things that we began in response to this COVID season is uh, <laughs> when the season began, we reached out to folks that we knew at DCF, uh, organizations that were advocates. Uh, for children and families in the foster care community, just to listen to what the needs were. And one of the things that we heard was that there are a number of families who are experiencing gaps in the social services that are available to families to help in this time of crisis. And so um, we, our intention is certainly not 
to circumvent those social systems and resources, nonprofits who are doing excellent work to support families, but really to step into gaps to provide um, some tangible support in moments of crisis for families while workers come alongside families to develop plans for towards sustainability. This is a season where uh, the need is only going to become greater. About 80% of referrals to DCF are made by mandated reporters or uh, through uh, close relatives or neighbors of families. And so in this season, um, while there aren't as many eyes on kids, there's been a dramatic decrease in the number of, of uh, referrals. But as many of you have seen, there is an expected increase in the amount of domestic violence that's being experienced, substance abuse, et cetera. And so as things continue to reopen, as kids get back into school and daycare, workers get back into homes, we anticipate that the need for families to step in to provide temporary care through foster care uh, is going to only increase. And so if you're interested in and have ever thought about becoming a foster adoptive family, we'd love to talk a little bit more about that. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap things up here. Um, I appreciate, I know we went a little bit longer than we thought, so I appreciate everyone's patience with that. Um, thank you so much, each and every one of you for being on this call. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. thanks, Matt. And thanks to all the panelists who took time out of their busy schedule to share with us and be with us this morning. I'm Chris and I'm the lead pastor at Reunion. And if this is your first time checking us out, I'm so glad you joined us. It's my prayer that today's conversation was challenging and encouraging and hopefully inspiring because I hope it gave you a glimpse into the kind of church we want to be and where we're headed as a community. And I pray it moves us all to action. And so a few quick things. If you're looking to get connected to Reunion or want to find out more information about our community, we'd love for you to go to our website, reunionmovement.com, and click the Connect With Us bubble so we can get to know you and you can get to know us. Now, I don't know about you, but the past few weeks through the pandemic and the, event, the events of injustice in our country have revealed in me and revealed to me the anger and the pride and the fear and even the hatred that it's, that's at work in our world right now. And if we're honest, all of it can feel overwhelming and it's painful and sometimes we don't know where to start. And so Today, I've been walking through my neighborhood lamenting, crying out to God, and asking for God to show me how I can best love my neighbors and engage the needs of my city. And I want to invite you to do the same at some point today. See, one of the best ways we can, get, we can begin to change broken systems is by listening to those around us, hearing their story, and then working together to create a better future. And so this morning, I want to invite you to consider becoming a neighborhood ambassador. By signing up to be a neighborhood ambassador, you're committing to love your neighbors in tangible ways and to be the church where you live, work, and play. You're committing to the hard work of listening to the needs of our city and our community and then working to meet those needs the best you can. We've got some amazing resources we'd love to share with you and help you on this journey. And so please text NEIGHBOR to 617-415-4466 and we'll send them your way. I also want to invite everyone to serve alongside us in one of our neighboring communities. At the beginning of the pandemic, we rolled out our four types of community and asked, are you connected to community at Reunion? Our dream uh, of the four types of community was it would be how we discover Jesus, become like Jesus, and do what Jesus did at Reunion. Neighboring communities are places where we learn to be good neighbors by serving our city and serving together. So we know food scarcity is a major issue in our city, especially in the midst of COVID-19. And so we have two food pantries that we partner with in the city. We're reserving consistent days of the week and time slots to fill with volunteers from our community. And we're hoping to get a good rotation of people from the reunion community to serve together on a regular basis. But you can decide how often and when you want to volunteer. The first food pantry is in Dorchester with Faith Christian Church. And we'll be helping every other Friday with them. If you're interested in this opportunity, you can text FCC to 617-415-4466. Dan and Gently from our Quincy location are helping lead this effort. Thanks for doing that. The other food pantry partnership is in Medford at Mystic Community Market. We'll be helping with them weekly on Tuesdays. And if you're interested in that opportunity, you can text MYSTIC to 617-415-4466. 
Paige from our Somerville location is helping lead this effort. Thanks a lot, Paige. And then you just heard from Mike Brown with Fostering Hope on our panel. Through our partnership with Fostering Hope, we're hoping to build a support and resource team for foster and adoptive families in our city uh, made up of people from the reunion community. And so if you're interested in joining that team or even learning more about how we can support and care for foster families in our city, please text FOSTER to 617-415-4466. Please consider serving alongside us in one of these neighboring communities over the next few weeks. And if you're interested in starting a neighboring community uh, around a need in our city that you're aware of, please don't hesitate to reach out. Now, normally, we take time in our gathering to take communion together. This morning, we want to encourage you to take communion on your own in your home with your family, friends, roommates, or join us at our prayer gathering tonight, and we'll take communion together as a family. Our weekly prayer gathering starts at 8 p.m. The Zoom link can be found in our chat or on the website. And then if you have something that you want us to be praying for you or with you about, please text prayer to 617-415-4466. Lastly, I just want to close our time with a benediction. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger, and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them, to turn their pain into joy. May God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in the world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done, to bring justice and kindness to all our children and to the poor. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.